you know, even looking around, um, I see a couple of people uh, from Margaret Thulier from the past and Veronica Santorum from the present, from the present. And uh, it's so lovely to connect with you all um, and uh, Denise. And I, I also, you know, it's really, um, I suppose the focus of tonight is it's so much about uh, eco-social art. And it's very much about um, the collective and about socially engaged work um, and obviously creating beautiful work at the same time. Um, so some of you may or may not have heard the term eco-social art before. Um, and I'm going to give a, a very um, a, 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 an introduction, a very gentle introduction to it, um, because it can be many things for many people. Um, so I think I'm going to start the presentation now. Um, so I'm going to upload the slides. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just talking, I was just saying to um, Carmel that I, I was like Speedy Gonzales on Zoom for so long. And now that I haven't been on it for so long, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a slightly more challenging. Landed. Yes, that's great, Cathy. I'll mute myself now. And if everybody could mute themselves if they're not already, that'd be great. Thanks very much, Cathy. Great. Thanks, Carmel. So welcome uh, to the talk on eco art in pursuit of a sustainable planet. And um, that's a title of a book, actually. This book, To Life, Eco Art in Pursuit of a Sustainable Planet by Linda Weintraub. I think I'm pronouncing that um, incorrectly. And um, it's it's an amazing book. And really, I think the title of that book sort of encompassed um, my, I suppose, my values around uh, around art. Because for a long time, I was I felt I was creating lovely things. Um, and I felt that, um, you know, I needed to give them meaning. And that's where the, the sort of the ecological or the environmental focus came in to the work um, that I'm currently collaborating on and, and doing in my own personal art practice. So um, the image you're looking at here is uh, one that happened by accident, like a lot of eco art. You know, there's lots and lots of surprises, as I'm sure a lot of you will know if you've done any work with natural dyes or plants or eco printing. Uh, or making your inks. Um, and this, I thought, came out as a really, it sort of emerged as a lovely um, depiction of um, planet Earth, I suppose, the, 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 the rusty can top created that lovely circle. And then um, with the cornflower, the avocado dye bath um, and the oak tannin, this image came. And as you probably all know, with, with, with eco printing in particular, you know, it can be so surprising. Um, so this I was really, uh, yeah, I was really uh, encouraged by this, this beautiful piece that emerged. Um, and this was printed maybe three years ago. So it has stood the test of time. I presume the oak tannin has helped in that process. So just to give you some background on, on where I'm coming from, um, I suppose I've had a very, very diverse background in terms of of, of uh, paid work for example but it is interesting because no matter what I've done even though it's become very diverse um, I've really come back to um, my original space which was uh, teaching PE and geography um, and I think the geography the area of geography the area of geology that whole area was something that I was very I'm always very interested in um, and had pursued to um, degree level, but I find it, it's permeating the work I do now. And, and it's obviously a very um, important interest of mine, you know, and also sits very closely with my, my value system in terms of um, creating sustainable art. So um, my eco art, my, the practice that I do embodies an interconnection with nature, well-being and values literacy. Um, and just to talk to that values literacy a little bit, um, I was involved in a couple of courses with a woman called Cathy Fitzgerald of Haumea Eco Ecoversity. And one of the courses I was involved with was a course uh, called the Earth Charter. 
and the Earth Charter primarily looks at values literacy. Um, and, you know, and it's something I'm very invested in and, and it permeates a lot of my work also because I feel that, you know, our value systems are our true selves and who we are. And when you can bring people back to connect with their value systems, um, it helps then um, to, to, to connect with um, to connect with what's important to us. Um, and through my work, through the ecocentric lens and co-authorship with nature, Excuse me, I endeavour to facilitate accessible entry points to eco art because um, I know everybody's Everest is different. We all have a very different approach and we all have very different ways of, of creating our art or, or engaging with communities. Um, so the entry points for to eco art for self and others, it's about enabling creativity and, and also connection with place, because I think, you know, that intimacy with place, particularly you know, in the world we live in at the moment it is so vitally important, both, you know, in a circular way for ourselves and our own well-being, obviously, you know, as well as um, the climate crisis and biodiversity. So um, working with natural and sustainable methods of co-creating art, my place-based learning and facilitation focus on the circular theme. I'm very focused on the circular theme in my work. And it's for me, my brain, my very, very, very strong right brain, it works in a very system, systemic and uh, interconnected way. So my, I, through my work, uh, and I always saw it as a challenge in what I did, um, that my brain would go into outer space and I would think very much outside the box. And as, as a friend of mine said to me at one stage uh, before, we need to put you back in the box so that we can decide what you want to throw out of the box, because there are so many ideas being generated through the work, which has become very, which is quite challenging. Um, and I find, again, back to my values, this is really, you know, the work I'm, I'm endeavouring to, to work with at the moment is really, it, it, it's it's uh, facilitating that entry point for me, that system thinking, that circular theme um, of interconnecting um, sustainability for, for ourselves and for the planet we live in, because we're essentially all nature. Um, so just some place-based teaching and learning and socially engaged groups that I've been involved with. Um, so I many years ago, I was involved in doing a course called Creativity and Change in the Crawford. And that course, um, I suppose I found it pretty cathartic and, 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 and absolutely transforming in what I was doing. It almost gave it it gave me a framework for the way I saw the world and how things operated. So it was a very um creative in lots of different fora from everything from spoken word to you know to uh, design thinking to um, creating natural art so really a really amazing course um, and I also teach on the MA in art and engagement the eco art practice module in the Crawford um, I'm also connected with the Burren Bio Trust in the west of Ireland and have delivered a couple of workshops um, in that lovely that incredible space and um, as Carmel mentioned earlier, CCAS, the Centre of Excellence for Climate Action and Sustainability. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's an old uh, priest's retirement home and retreat centre. As some of you may know, or some of you may actually have been there on retreat um, in the past, but it is one of the most beautiful places in our locality. And a, um, a group of people called uh, Green Skibbereen, who successful, successfully opposed the Nerdles factory in Skibbereen, um, I'm going to pre-COVID, maybe five or six years ago, um, they took on this um, centre or this, this building with accommodation and uh, hundreds of acres of land and an ancient forest, and they are regenerating the actual space. Um, and they also host a variety of different workshops in, in areas related to cl um, climate action, sustainability, um, and they also have really nice spaces, you know, for any of you who would be interested in running any form of workshop or attending any form of workshop. They have a really nice new outdoor space and outdoor, a huge gazebo for outdoor teaching, outdoor teaching and learning. Um, so um, that is in Myris Wood, which is just um, beyond LEP. 
Uh, the, then the Centre for Global Development at UCC, I've done some work with Rosari Griffin in, in looking at the UN Sustainable Development Goals and uh, looking at them in a sy systematic way and, and connecting them to the work we do. And UCC, where I also do some teaching, um, there's a very strong focus in the college in, um, you know, in, in connecting your pedagogy and your teaching with um, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And as you possibly know, it, it's the first, it was the first green campus in the world. Uh, university campus in the world. And uh, the next part, next section, I'm going to talk to in more detail shortly, the She Can Do 2021 campaign. Um, I was a sustainability educator on that um, project, on that campaign um, for over a year. And then the I do some work with the NYCI also, um, working with youth workers to deliver uh, eco-social art or eco-art um, 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 courses to their uh, clients. So that's just a background resume to, to what I've done up to date. To date. <coughs> and, um, excuse me, so what is eco-social art? We're going to talk, I'm going to talk to that in just a moment. And then what we look at is we look down through um, different campaigns that I have been involved in. Um, and also there's, I mean, if you Google eco-social art, you, there's so many different um, uh, projects that are running at various different stages. There's an eco-fest in uh, the Irish Museum of Modern Art in September time. So it's really growing as a practice um, and as, as a, as a um, I suppose, as a way of working, you know, or as a way of, of, of engaging in socially engaged art. So the um, she can do 2020. Sorry. So the so the eco social art practice. Um, this term again. I came across this term in the first year of COVID. It's amazing what COVID brought to us. Um, the capacity to do an online course um, in eco literacy. So developing our own literacy to share with others around um, our art, um, our. Um, science, local knowledge, tradition, mythology. So the whole area of an ecological art practice. So not necessarily, you know, what we traditionally see as art. So art practices of, of painting and drawing. It much more, much, uh, and textiles, much further than that. Um, even in the area of eco-philosophy, um, eco-therapy, you know, engaging science. So if you read that, um, description of eco-social art it's very very as I mentioned that word already systemic or systematic or circular it's all about interconnection it's all about um regeneration it's about education it's about values-based education uh, and it's about hands-on it's really about you know head hands and heart it's very much about engaging uh, physically engaging with groups and communities and doing, and it's about your value system, your heart, and it's about your head. It's about knowing and connecting concepts and ideas within the whole area of, um, of our art. Um, so I, today I was, what was I trying to do today? I was trying to create a word cloud and I just, it was defying me. It was just one of those, probably the weather didn't help. But I ended up getting out um, some oak. I can't don't know if it's oak gall or horsetail ink, but I said I've just drawn out. It's just as easy. And it was so beautiful because um, the pen I have for writing with the ink is very um, you need to use it very mindfully and very carefully so that the ink will flow. So um, it was a beautiful, you know, what came from something that was quite perplexing and trying to make the word cloud was so challenging to actually slowing down and writing this out. It was so beautiful. And these felt pieces that I have throw, uh, popped on top of the page to just give it a bit of a zing. These are felt pieces, Carmel, from a Cork Textile Network um, uh, event. I It was a very, I think it was at St. John's College and this wonderful woman did a, um, a felting workshop. Um, I think she lives somewhere in West Cork. Her name doesn't come to me now, but um, but their pieces. So they're like 15 years old. They were sitting in a basket here. So it's lovely to 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 reuse them in a different way. But yeah, so eco, not ego, social art. 
you know I thought and, and to me that's really sums up what um, eco-social art is about it's really about going beyond yourself uh, and going into communities and and looking at your work for the greater good and engaging and interconnecting with people and uh, and, and collaborating with different people our groups and collaborating with 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 nature, collaborating with the forest, you know, collaborating with the beach, being in the space you're in, developing again that intimacy with your space. So uh, what I'd love to do just to stop for a moment is just ask you all if you could put a word in the um, messages, you know, so if you think of eco social art at this stage, like what is the word that comes to you? Like what's the word? that would, um, you know, uh, would be part of a definition of, of, of eco-social art. So what would that word be for you? If you could pop that into the um, message message box. Oh, just have a look at those. Sure. Christina Jasmine. Thanks. Um, so absolutely integrating, sustainable, yeah, organic community, absolutely nature, 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 connection, Lucy. Yeah, absolutely. So all, all of those words lend themselves towards eco-social art, um, art with a focus on environmental awareness, on ecology. Okay, so are you seeing my screen again? Not yet, Cathy. Not yet, okay. It's on the way. <laughs> Thank you. Hopefully. Okay, it should yeah. be with you. Lovely. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, oops. In terms of the eco-social art practices I'd like to share with you this evening, um, there are three very different eco-social art practices. Um, this is a talk by the Cork Textile Network, and there is a textile um, uh, connection with all three projects, but particularly um, with the, the middle project, the West Cork Flax project project. So the first project I'll talk to you about is the She Can Do 2021. And uh, then I'll talk to you about the West Cork Flax project and then the CCAS project that is just starting at the moment. So um, we've just made some um, plans around that, as in we've just started to grow, basically. Uh, and then there's another one, if I have time, I'll get to it. But um, I know the recording or the the presentation may be shared with you so you can have a look at it but I, I might just talk to it very quickly so I've, I'm going to talk to the three um, in bigger print first of all so like what I'd like you to do is think have that eco-social hat on or that looking through that eco-social lens or that eco-centric lens when you're looking through at these projects um, because they're all they're so complex in an eco-social way in terms of you know, the outreach involved, the collaborations, the, the various different, um, uh, I suppose, stakeholders involved in these projects. So the first one is, some of you may have heard of it, it was called the She Can Do 2021 campaign. So it was a campaign um, by a very good friend of mine, Karen Weeks, to be the first Irish female to solo row the Atlantic. So on the 6th of December 2021, Karen left uh, Puerto McGann in Gran Canaria to row to Barbados. And uh, she was solo rowing, so she was carrying all of her supplies. Um, and just to summarise, it took her 80, just over 80 days to get to Barbados, uh, which was well outside her expected time. Um, she had anything that could have gone wrong, went wrong. And she also had phenomenal experiences um, along the way. Um, and in her very positive way, you know, she relays her whole experience in a very positive framework. She's also um, a sports psychologist. That's her doctorate is in sports psychology. So she was doing action based learning, firsthand action based learning. So um, with that in mind, I was uh, the sustainability educator on Karen's campaign, self-elected because I was so interested in what she was doing. And I thought it was much beyond, it's more, it was, it was beyond actually rowing 
a, a boat on your own across the Atlantic for two and a half months. Um, so we started to engage with a lot of different people involved in, um, in, 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 in various areas of, of environmental protection. Um, we also incidentally had, um, and I'll talk to it a little bit more again, but the, the children from uh, schools all over the world um, sent questions to us. And we had a couple of children from a local school here in Clonakilty who actually interviewed Karen when she was on the Atlantic because she had um, she had Wi-Fi. She was testing um, a system for uh, MTU. So she actually had access to Wi-Fi. Uh, if you can believe it, the whole way across the Atlantic, which was phenomenal to just call her up and on WhatsApp and see her and talk to her and see what was around her. It was a really, uh, a really meaningful experience for the students. So um, as part of the campaign, um, and I move through these um, quickly, as part of the campaign, we looked at the UN Sustainable Development Goals because it's um, they were a very good uh, hook or an anchor for um for looking at um, the she can do uh, Karen's role across the Atlantic and the, and the collaboration with the various schools, um, and they also there was also an element of kudos involved with them because you know even on her campaign when she would mention the sustainable development goals you know people a lot of people involved in education would have uh, some connection with them so you know it was sort of a hook or something they could connect with. Um, and then um, out of the out of the She Could Do campaign, I started a Paddle with Purpose project, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then we had a schools plastic project. And the culmination of all of that was a film, a very short film that we made um, about uh, life below water. So the, the, the second, the UN SDG, UN Sustainable Development Goal 14. So I'll very quickly move through the um, UN SDGs, um, and a lot of you may know them already. But if you don't, um, and the, if you Google UN SDG, you'll, you'll you know you get a good idea of what they are. There's, there's so many resources online about the SDGs. So they were adopted by the UN in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet and ensure that by 2030, all people enjoy peace and prosperity. Now, that's a huge statement, you know, and we can all talk very in a critical way to that. But the 17 SDGs that are integrated and they recognize that action in one area affects outcomes in others and that development must balance social, economic and environmental sustainability. So back to the system thinking and the circular thinking, you know, uh, you know, every action uh, has a reaction and, 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 and a lot most things are, are very, very interconnected and we're very dependent on one another and on our on our um, animate and inanimate objects. So the creativity and the know-how technology and financial resources from all of society is necessary to achieve the SDGs in every context. And what was great about these SDGs is that they, they had a very economic focus. So um, businesses, you know, I know one of the businesses that we were involved with that supported the campaign, Ardmore Shipping, which is uh, based in Cork, Singapore and Bermuda. You know, one of the reasons that they would have onboarded this campaign was that they were connected uh, to they, they they as a business had connected to the UN SDGs and also um uh, so they could see they could they could see the the SDGs in action through the campaign so that served um their purpose also so the first one we looked at uh, and this was one we primarily focused on was the gender equality uh, as I said, Karen is a, um, a, a psychologist or a um, sports psychologist, and she really endeavoured to promote uh, leadership and equality and empowerment in, in women and girls. The second one then we looked at primarily was UN, the SDG 14, Life Below Water. So that was about looking after our waterways. And again, not just looking after the sea and picking up plastic, but like looking at the whole pattern of how does the plastic end up in the water in the first place? What does the what's the damage it does? How can we go back to the source and help to rectify in some in, in our own small way uh, the challenges that are, are, are as a consequence of, of um, marine pollution? And then this one was really interesting because this goal 17 is all about global partnerships. And as a consequence of this, we had schools in Paris, we had a school in Barbados, we had a school in Gran Canaria, we had multiple schools in Ireland. We had um, input from 
um, the School of Bees in UCC. We had input from Dr. Susan Steele, who's director of the European Fisheries Control Agency. She had been with the Seafood, the Seafood Protection Authority in Cor in Clonakilty, actually. We had Mia Moore Motley, who was the Prime Minister of Barbados. She was also um, in, in, well engaged. She she um, contacted us in regard to the actual um with to the campaign as well and we had the uccs the eri were also we were also connected with the eri so the pilot purpose project um was really about collecting uh foreshore plastic and we did a lot of that around clonakilty bay maybe three or four kilometers around the bay and as part of the coast watch europe survey and interestingly a local primary school teacher saw this happening and um contacted me and asked could we do something with her third class in the girls primary school in Clonakilty so what we ended up doing was we ended up doing some beach cleaning we ended up um uh, making jewelry and crafts and paint brushes and uh, painting sticks from you know the various di different pieces of plastic that we found um along along the foreshore you know, and, and it was interesting, even after after the after I had finished with them as a group, you know, you'd meet them on the beach and they'd be out picking up plastic. And you just think, you know, it's just that small little difference, you know, that you can make. It's like, you know, a butterfly flaps its wings sort of concept. Um, so it, I was just out initially on the board, just picking up plastic because, um, yeah, and, and a couple of people joined me and the next thing involved. Um, and so the school um, in Clonakilty, they uh, made jewellery, as I said, from the um, the plastic and they entered um, an engineering, I can't remember the name of it now, some, an engineering comp um, competition with their with their idea of creating the jewellery. So, you know, it has the, the project itself has been hugely inspirational and the teacher is carrying it on with her subsequent classes now because this happened in 2022 last year yeah um and then um following the school's plastic project we had um uh the girls uh, we had a filmmaker on the project um and the uh, filmmaker gary i had asked him to just record a little bit about um water pollution and next thing Gary arrived down to the beach in Clannacilty and he made this fantastic very short video of um related to the campaign and also uh, related to the um the life below water um UN sustainable development goals so i'm going to show that to you now um and this is it and it's just it's about 5 minutes long and i know you're going to enjoy it Babies are actually called uh, puppies too, and also they bark like like a dog, like they go. <coughs> sometimes we bring the prongs, but then and sometimes we bring a bag as well. But then sometimes we never bring bring anything, so we just have to carry it in our hands. The she can do campaign is focusing on two of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we're looking at gender equality which is goal five, and we're also looking at goal 14, which is life below water. So we've had an amazing morning here on Inchidani with uh, groups of young school children out collecting ocean plastic. Okay, okay, okay. everybody dig! Operation dig! Uh, now pull! Oh, Jesus! Everyone pass it, pass it, If we get this out, it's going to be very good, because I can feel that it's, it's doing a lot of harm. Yeah! We got it! We got it! We got it. And there's a couple of other campaigns that we connect with. Uh, one of them is Coasts to Watch Europe. Another one then is the Antashka Two Minute Beach Clean. And also we connect with the Little Earth Charter. So we're really delighted to be connected with all of those uh, inspirational campaigns and really they've come as a consequence of She Can Do.
Hey guys, Karen here. Uh, day 62, would you believe, out on the Atlantic and um, I'm chatting to you today from right over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, which is actually amazing. So like down below us, three to 5,000 meters are sulfur springs and googly-eyed fish and all that sort of stuff. So, uh, and actually it was only discovered in 1985. I just heard that from a lady called Susan Steele. We have our, she did a short message there the other day. We have it up on our Facebook, or uh, sorry, on our website. Uh, well worth the watch. Um, a really interesting person but uh, yeah it's just amazing to think that that all is all underneath me and Lily here. At the moment Karen is actually rowing over the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and she's experiencing a phenomenal amount of wildlife there and two of the things that we've spoken to her about are the goose barnacles and also the by the wind sailors they're called Velela Velela what a lovely word. Barnacles. And what's really interesting is, so you know the way Karen has to get out of her boat every week? Yeah, she has yeah. to clean the goose barnacles. To clean the hull, exactly. Our focus in the She Can Do campaign in Life Below Water is collecting ocean plastics and bringing awareness of ocean plastics and the effect of ocean plastics on the planet. And one of the pieces of research that we were looking at recently was looking at neopelagic colonies floating in the oceans. And what neopelagic colonies are, they're pieces of plastic that have amalgamated with fishing net and uh, 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 bamboo and lots of different particles that float in the oceans. And what has happened is our goose barnacles, our by-the-wind sailors, and all of those pelagic fish, which are the fish that live near the top of the water, they have colonized these floating pieces of plastic. In the past, a lot of wildlife would have um, surfed a ride on these rafts, but because these rafts were usually wood or degradable natural materials, they didn't last for long periods of time. So we didn't have that crossing over of the various different organisms that we find in the sea. When we spoke with Karen last week, Karen mentioned that she had seen one of these neopelagic colony rafts made up of bits of bamboo, bits of fishing net, bits of plastic. So it's that natural and unnatural coming together, forming that colony. The early days of the She Can Do campaign, a group of us got together and we started what we called the Paddle With Purpose project. And within that project, what we did is we set out in our paddle board whenever we could and we started collecting plastic along the foreshore. We must have collected plastic from maybe three or four kilometres of, of the foreshore around this area. So as a result of collecting the plastic, um, a local girls school started making amazing things, repurposing the plastic, using their initiative, being incredibly innovative and making things like jewellery, different crafts, even some art supplies from the repurposed plastic that they found on the beach. This is some of our um, jewellery. We actually found this Please Recycle Me bottle lid and we thought that like, well that would work really well and it's on a broken chain. Please Recycle Me, clean up very well. Can you see it? Yeah, 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 I can see and, it in this glass. And, and, and then there's one from a stapler. And there's fishes. Yeah, and, but one of the earrings are broken but we can fix it. And, and then this is a, a, a bracelet. And we made it a matching. And then this is out of seam. And we decided that this was so nice looking that we didn't want to decorate it with anything. So yeah. This is just a bracelet that you can tie to your hand. So through the lens of thinking globally and acting locally, you know, this She Can Do is a worldwide campaign. Our schools in Paris, Barbados, Gran Canaria, all around the world and locally here in Ireland. It's been hugely inspirational. So it was just amazing to have those children on the beach this morning, running around, hopping, skipping, jumping, collecting plastic, having fun with one another, you know, connecting with their environment, running into the sea, and really, you know, spreading that message of having respect for the ocean.
like you're not inspired by those gorgeous kids. Um, and, you know, I even I even thought listening to the, you know, their language about, well, we can fix it, you know, even those, all of those things. And, you know, I, I just find them incredibly inspiring, as you can probably see. Um, so, yeah, so that was one project. That was one uh, eco-social art project. And as I mentioned to you at the beginning, you know, just to put the lens of eco-social art on it and you see all of those various connections, it, it, it's just incredible, you know, uh, and it is so much about generating awareness um, uh, uh, intergenerationally you know, and working intergenerationally um, on, on, on ecological type projects. So the second project I'd like to share with you is uh, the West Cork Flax uh, Eco-Social Project. And very interestingly, again, goodness, COVID, uh, I, my creative hat just blew off my head during COVID because at the very beginning, you know, it's really inspired by the eco-literacy course. Um, I started to look into sustainable fashion and sustainable fabrics. Um, and just by accident, actually heard that there was a lot of um, there was a huge flax industry in, in West Cork. I mean, I always think about Northern Ireland, but I hadn't realized. Uh, and also inspired by by um, by Carmel and Anne's project, you know, and the Douglas Mills. You know, I, I, I knew it was a pro place of processing, but I hadn't thought about well, where does the flax come from, you know, in the first place. Um, so I started to uh, do some research and was blown away um, and really uncovered, you know, a lot of information and, and collated a lot of, I mean, there was a lot of information out there, but part of it was actually collating all of that information, which, uh, you know, is an ongoing process. So the project um, that we were looking at is, uh, it's really about unremembering and celebrating the heritage, uh, you know, and the social history of growing um, and linen production in West Cork in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, because I hadn't realized that uh, primarily in West Cork was a, the, the, the flax mill I was focusing on, uh, I have been focusing on as a flax mill in Conina, which is between uh, Ross Carberry and Lep. Um, and um, and then there was a linen hall in Clonakilty. So, you know, between everything, it was, um, like it was very local. So in terms of meeting people and connecting with people who had been involved in the flax industry, uh, the growing of flax, the spinning of flax, um, it, it was all on our on our doorstep here. So it was very much about, you know, connecting the social history, you know, the growing of flax um, and also celebrating, celebrating the past and acknowledging the past and acknowledging the past in terms of, you know, Lynn um, I was chatting with Veronica, who's here um, to, this evening. Um, I was chatting with her yesterday and, you know, she mentioned how the linen uh, and growing of flax was very much um, a very obviously extremely labor intensive, but and, and a lot of people were in in desperation that were involved in these industries and I think that's possibly a consequence you know when I look at West when I think of it now looking at West Cork you know that we were on the periphery I mean the periphery of Ireland you know as any coastal county is or a coastal area is but also the periphery of Europe you know so um so the mill in 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 Conina um only started mid World War II because uh, we couldn't imp um, because the UK primarily couldn't import flax from Flanders, Belgium, uh, Russia. So we ended up um, generating a growing flax, making linen for for the war effort, primarily for bandages, for for airplanes, uh, for aero flax, for um, for uniforms, you know, and, and, and many, many other 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 uses. So the research then in terms of the the phases of research. Uh, so as I said, it was during COVID that I started looking, looking at the history of flax uh, internationally and, and focusing on, on West Cork um, and uh, visited the Conina Mill and established who owned the field after 20 calls to 20 different houses in, in the area, uh, found the people who own the mill. And very interestingly, in my pursuit of who owned the field that the mill was now in, I came across a, a gorgeous older woman in her mid 90s who had worked in the flax mill. And that was such a, you know, it was such a treat. It was f phenomenal, really. Um, and that is the thing, I suppose the people involved in that mill are in that at that stage of their lives now. So there was an urgency in collecting and connecting with people um, to, to find out their stories. 
Um, so then last summer we had a we held um, through the Feel Goods Gibreen Festival, we held um, a fantastic community based workshop based on um, the history of flax and working songs. Um, I'm sure some of you have heard of, of walking the tweet um, where uh, women would sit around a table to wash and clean the, the, the wool fabric. Um, and associated with that was a singing, a singing tradition. And there were lots of, of different, um, uh, I suppose, I don't know what you call them. There was lots of things connected with them. So, for example, if you missed a line in a verse or if you you passed to the right instead of the left, it brought you bad luck for 20 years or whatever. So there was some fabulous stories. And we also connected with the woman, dear Geneva Huna. She works in the university in the Outer Hebrides in, in a Gaelic university. And she has done a lot of her research on um, working songs. So it was, again, very interesting collaboration. So that was... Uh, myself, it was um, uh, Karen Minahan, who's an, um, an actor and a director and a writer. She's written a book, actually, Ordinary, Extraordinary Women, about the women of the Civil War. Um, and um, an ex-student of mine from when I was teaching in school, um, uh, Uda Collins, and uh, sorry, Michelle Collins, and Michelle um, uh, is doing her PhD research on the art on Queenu, uh, the art of Keening. Um, in Norway. So, you know, we had an amazing collaboration and then we brought local people in or local people joined us to to um, to engage in the workshop. Um, so um, then um, this year I've planted flax in the ruins of the mill. I just thought, you know, we did some so lovely sound recordings there and I just thought it would be really yeah, it'd be just very meaningful to to just to plant some flax in its ruins um, because I had actually met with the um, uh, the daughter of the man who had owned the the, the mill in Conina herself and her sister. Uh, I met them last summer and and, and had a lengthy interview with them. Um, you know, and they they talked about their mother and her her contribution in terms of you know looking after people who had. Um, you know, had 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 um, injured themselves in the mill because it was a very like flax production itself was was a very arduous process and a very dangerous process, and there were so many different phases of, of the production of flax. So um, then um, there was a fibre shed. I'm not sure if you're aware of fibre shed in Dublin. Um, fibre shed are they're an organisation, a voluntary organisation. They look at whole area of sustainable fabric really. Uh, in a nutshell, and uh, they had an amazing event in Dublin last uh, October, November, and Malin Linen, which is in Donegal, Malin Linen, the, the woman from Malin Linen, uh, gave a talk and gave us some very useful information about growing it and processing it. Um, and so we prepared flax then, um, we prepared the plot at Seacast, and I'll be planting out this weekend. Um, and just very recently, I have um, been uh, chatting with Veronica, who's here tonight. Um, she's based in Kilfinan and County Limerick. And uh, it's really, it's uh, Carmel asked me at the beginning, am I doing this on my own or am I engaging with people? And it's just so fantastic to engage with somebody else uh, and another community um, and, and and to share experiences and, and, um, and um, yeah, and exploring the flax for linen. And uh, then uh, uh, the final stage then is um, Veronica's group in County Limerick are holding a mehel harvesting of the flax in um, October, September, October time. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, so in a nutshell, that is the flax project. These are the seedlings uh, I had planted um, and there's mixed opinions. Um, and I will get a learning early with this. There's mixed opinions um, as to whether to plant them, propagate them and put them in the, in the ground or to put the seeds directly in the ground. Um, I ended up propagating because I didn't have the opportunity to prepare the ground as, as soon as I, I had wanted to prepare it. So that is the rationale for having planted them here. Um, so they're coming up very, very nicely. And um, I traveled to my um, home place in Borough County Offaly last weekend for four days. And the flax came with me in the car because I had to I wanted to make sure it was watered and nurtured and looked after. So I think I'm going to get a very uh, strong sense of mourning or a strong sense of um, 
yeah, letting them go when I actually put them in the ground, um, and, and we when we put them in the ground, and 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 uh, you know, hopefully they won't um, have any 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 vermin or any uh, insects meeting them to nibble on them. But sure, look, it's all circular; it's all happening. So this is a sample flax plot then that I was involved with, but it was like um, just in the planting uh, last year in Kinvara in County Clare. And this is how beautiful it looks, you know, and these flowers stay on the flax for quite a short amount of time. Um, so they're but they're an absolute beauty to see a swathe of them in, in, the, in a field. And uh, just to show you some of my own work. Um, so the. Um, this is linen and cotton. So I have a linen. I was doing the print on the linen on the left. And uh, I'm sure some of you do eco printing. Um, sometimes you're, the iron blanket, so the blanket you dip in iron to um, to mordant the fabric, it can have the most beautiful, um, more ethereal sort of qualities. Um, so I, I always love to um, keep the... Um, the um, iron blanket as well as the, um, the what you call it, the, the original fabric, the linen. And as you can see, the linen um, is very interesting to print on because the lin linen is a bast fiber, which means that, you know, it's, it's actually quite complex. So for the ink to get in or the dye to get in to the actual linen, you know, it, is, it isn't as easy as it would be on cotton or silk, for example. Uh, and there's a wonderful woman in, um, sorry, there's a wonderful woman in um, Scariff in County Clare, Jennifer, uh, her business is uh, Apple Oak Fibre. And uh, I was on a, a weekend with her recently, um, uh, indigo print, indigo dyeing and natural dyeing. And she um, has, she went into a lot of detail about, you know, the various types of fabric, you know, and how they, they receive the dyes. So that's where I learned about that in terms of the linen uh, and how receptive or otherwise it is to ink. And this is another piece. Um, uh, I'm living here uh, beside the marsh, uh, Clahine Marsh uh, near Inchidani, and um, we have the yellow flag irises coming out at the moment and they're just beyond beautiful. But this is the yellow flag iris, the leaf, um, along with um, the... Um, uh, the flax shaft and this is again on cotton and on linen and uh, dipped in a eucalyptus dye bath which when mixed with the um the rust or the iron gave this beautiful like deep gray purple color and very quickly uh, this is the uh, project i've just started the grow dye cook compost where we're uh, we have a community garden so we're growing all of our own vegetables and um, we're then going to, um, I'll swap those words around, we're going to cook. So we're going to have a, like a mehel of cooking, um, you know, the, the products that we have grown. Um, and consequently, then we'll use the leftovers to create dyes. And then because the dyeing process we go through is completely natural, everything then can be composted. Um, so there is a, um, the, we have a no dig plot, we're weeding and watering um, we're going to be cooking and eating, using the waste for dyeing. And then we have a wormery and also a compost heap so we can compost all of our leftovers, our cooked food and our, our, um, our raw food. Uh, and this then goes back to the circular economy, you know, the whole idea of going from, you know, if we're back so that, that our, our basically our, our uh, compost or our um, goes back into to, to um, support the growth for the, the next set of um, vegetables coming on board or next year's vegetables. Sorry, my, my the sun now is, uh, is catching me coming in the window. The beautiful sunshine, I shouldn't complain. So, um, yeah, so then the, just very quickly, this was um, a dahlia dyeing, basically where a local a woman in Dribbleague, um, Mags, has a beautiful place called Bumblebee Flower Farm. She grows all her own organic flowers. Um, and I've done a little bit of work with her in um, growing dahlias and printing with, or, or sorry, printing, making inks and, and um, dyes with uh, dahlias. And they're absolutely beautiful. And very interestingly, they have stood the test of time, certainly on paper, on exposed paper, you know, so they're, they seem to be quite light fast. 
Um, but again, um, uh, Mags holds medals at her place in um, in in Dream League, where she actually brings people in, and we help to you know to dig up the bulbs carefully, dig up the bulbs and store them over winter, and then get the land ready for the um, planting the following year. Um, so this is just an image of the dyes, uh, the colours that came from one red dahlia. So by, you know, shifting the pH, as I'm sure many of you know about in, in, in um, ink making or dye making, you know, using bicarbonate soda, lemon, dahlia, iron, vinegar, copper, sulfate, um, we get this, like, th this is just a, a drop of the ocean of the colours that you can achieve. You know, and then very interestingly, um, you know, dahlias, uh, you know, I was doing some research into dahlias then. And, you know, I mean, I, one thing inspires another. And, you know, when you have a story behind something, it, it then it then becomes so interesting. So, yeah, so that is the dahlia dye. So so we looked at the She Can Do campaign and uh, under the, through the lens of the eco social art, we looked at the um the flax project and the grow dye cook and compost project and this um just just a dabble into the the area of dahlia dyeing um so so really what i what i wanted to i'm going to stop sharing now so i'm um, sorry carmel i'm not sure if you're going to share this powerpoint i'm happy for you to do it but i have a bibliography really of um you know, eco art or eco social art related uh, areas, and 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 also the areas um, connected to the the she can do campaign, um, and some books. So if if uh, and if or if anybody wants it, I can I can send it on individually. Um, that's no issue at all. So thank you so much. Um, I'm so delighted uh, to be here, and thanks for coming out uh, in on out on such a, a sunny evening. Um because uh, it would have been nice to be sitting in the garden as some of you may be actually doing. So I'll stop sharing. And um, again, as, as Carmel said at the outset, if you have any questions um, or if there's any comments you want to make or anything, anything at all, please shout. And I'm going to sit down lower. Thank you so much, thanks a million. I, um, I don't think we have any questions at the moment in the, in, in the uh, chat there. Fiona had to leave early, so sad I have to join another group lecture. What an inspirational speaker. I fully agree with that. Anyway, Cathy, you're absolutely Great. amazing. I'm delighted we have access to a recording. So, yeah, that's that's right. So I don't know if there's any need to send out the um, the PowerPoint. Oh, yes, of course, you have the recording. You have the record. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So people can refer back to that if they'd like to. That was incredible. That was absolutely yeah. amazing, Kathy. And just going back to the She Can Do project, I was wondering, are you aware of the work that um, Helen O'Shea does? I don't know if Helen's here tonight, actually, but Helen does this magnificent work um, based on recycled materials and bottles and her work has now has been you know in collect and in Sachi gallery and she's one of her own members as well but okay, you know I'll milk turn into magnificent winged animals and things like that you should look her up she's quite remarkable please, Helen. And she would have started off basically making um jewelry and uh, fabulous recycled items from from you know coastal coastal pickups you know things like that so it's quite remarkable her work Great. I look into Helen. Yeah, I know all that. I and the other thing is, well, with you. Zoom And uh, Alice Fox did a talk as well on flax flax production. Um, I'm sorry, my my internet seems to be a bit unstable actually so apologies for that wonder if you can hear me kathy yep yep mm. just yeah you're coming in out a little bit but i can hear you that's my poor my poor 
for uh, internet apologies for that just one other thing I'd love to say actually and Veronica Santorum might be interested in this but it's just something that kind of has has bothered me over the years in terms of the flax industry you know I have this book here but I wonder does does anybody recognize this fabulous cup it just to be awarded by the RDS um, for excellence and many of our members Mary and Anne have won this cup a couple of times Times phenomenal piece of work in itself, but it it depicts actually flax production in Limerick. So I'll just show it to you there again. I wonder if you if you can see it. You can see that lady spinning on her on her um uh, on her spinning wheel there. But it's it's about flax production, and it was actually awarded um for to the tenant of the greatest number of acres of flax produced during three successive seasons in county limerick so that's why i just wanted to mention that to veronica because i think i think we need to get some kind of campaign going to get that lovely cup out there again you know so it's just sitting on a shelf in in the rds and recognizing textiles i think is so important but anyway that's just a little bee in my bonnet seeing as you mentioned flax I thought I'd just bring that up and maybe Veronica might be interested in this. Um, so there's lots of lo lovely comments coming in again. Um, uh, sorry, I wanted to ask if you, oh, yeah, no, question from Imelda. I wanted to ask if you used earth pigments. It was mentioned on the intro notes. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Um, yes, uh, hi Imelda. Um, I have had to do a lot of uh, drafting and redrafting earlier and um, I left out the earth pigments, but yeah, I have um, uh, the, uh, what's it called? The Land Art Agency on Instagram. Um, they have, they have some really lovely courses and uh, maybe a year or two ago, I did an earth pigment course. And now again, back to the geology and the geography and the rocks. It's like I can't pass a rock uh, without picking it up. Um, and yeah, so I have made earth pigments. And I wonder, have you made them also, Imelda? Imelda, you might like to um, unmute yourself, maybe. Oh, I find it hard to see now. Yeah, maybe, maybe Imelda has also made them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's another huge area I think a lot of people uh, yeah sorry can you hear me we can no? yeah okay yeah no I have done some earth pigments mixed with soya um milk and uh, made some paintings and our fabric uh, designed landscapes and things like that so I was just wondering if you did wow <laughs> I haven't gone to that stage, Imelda. Very interestingly, and uh, like feeding into the next question, is your art practice um, a sort of data collection? And Michelle, I think you have, have solved my mystery uh, that I've had for quite a long time because, yeah, a, a lot of it is. And 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 going back to Imelda's point, I I've just. I've just made earth pigments like the basic earth pigments I love finding out how to do them and then sharing the knowledge broadly because um yeah I I I, I, I a lot of the time I I like you know the eco printing because I find it if uh, it's, it's a very mindful process but interesting a lot of the other work that I'm involved with I do it because yeah I love the research and um you know, the collecting of data and, and actually the social, and I think that's probably what inspired the eco-social art with me is that, you know, it's the social element of it. So Michelle, thank you so much for uh, that comment because it really has consolidated a lot of, of yeah, where my interest really lies. And I, I hadn't even really known that. So yeah, interesting, very interesting. There's a lovely question there from Raike. Have have you ever looked into making biomaterials? Ooh, I haven't. I haven't. But I think Veronica Santorum. Uh, sorry, Veronica, to put you on the spot. But in the eco art, art practice module on the Masters in Art and Process in use in MTU, um, there was certainly was a lecture or a workshop this year that looked into. Um, biomaterials um, and personally I haven't excuse me I haven't um, gone down that rabbit hole yet yeah, I've stayed in a box for a while <laughs> I've stayed in a box Rika 
yeah, yeah. It Have looks... you been involved yourself, Rika? No, I'm very interested. But there's certain materials, uh, they sound dangerous. Glycerine is part of, yeah. you can make it by grinding eggshells or anything really natural. And then you add also seaweed powder or, you know, algae. Okay. But glycerine, uh, the seaweed is called agar agar, but I haven't tried it. So I was interested agar, in agar, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you have any connections of someone in Cork or around Cork who has experimented with it. But maybe I'll have to do that next and put on my list and try it myself. But yeah. it just looks very nice. It's a, they're very different, transparent or opaque. They're interesting materials to look into. Great. Thanks, Rika. Yeah. Sorry, that. I'll unmute myself there. Oh, I see a question. Yeah, Denise. Denise, um, not not intentionally, Denise, but I wonder, do you, from your time in Australia, do you have any, you know, had you come across uh, the rock art and the Aboriginal art, and do you have any further an insight into it? Um, I don't really, Catty, but it yeah. just kind of, um, I think as you were speaking, it just uh it just really reminded me of the art that I saw when when I was living there and and uh, uh, like I suppose that was the original art you know the first type of art and um and in some ways that you're you're going back to that or or you're you're creating that in a modern context it just seemed interesting okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it, that's that's a that's a absolutely to the point, Denise. And and interestingly, only it was a couple of years ago after eco printing and making dyes for a few years, I thought I was amazing discovering these amazing things. And then I, I you know, I figured, oh my goodness, yeah, where did the original? Who wrote the Book of Kells? What was it written with? So in fact, you know, it's 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 back. It's gone full circle, hasn't it? You know, in terms of you know, revisiting all of those phenomenal and, and natural skills and materials that um, were used in the past. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, the Aboriginals, they have, a lot, they have a lot to account for, really. I mean, that the fact that rock art has lasted the test of time is, is mind-blowing, you know. Yeah, as is, you know, obviously linen that was found, in, you know, uh, was created in Egyptian times. And yeah, there's just a, such an expanse, I suppose, of, of um, traditional crafts and arts that are, are, are resurfacing now. And, and it's interesting, I always wonder, you know, is it, is it partially a consequence of where we're at in terms of environmental art and the importance of it now? Or has it gone full circle and we're just coming back to it or maybe meld of both? It's, it's fascinating. Uh, the whole area is 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 absolutely incredible, and um, there's a, there's a lovely note there. Oh, thanks. Um, Rika has actually seen that. Materium.org is a good resource site for bio materials from D. Thank you for sharing that, D. Um, and it's it's amazing, actually, Kathy. I I suspected there wouldn't be many questions. Well, how wrong was I? You know, this is probably the most involved that um, the audience has been in any talk which is fantastic. So there's clearly a huge amount of interest in it, you know, so um, fantastic. Thank you very much. I, yeah. I think unless anyone has any further further questions, we might just uh, we might just wrap it up if that's OK. Mm -hmm. And further, you know, j just to say huge thanks, Cathy. Yeah, and, and thank you to you too, Carmel, and the Cork Textile Network, because, you know, it, it is, again, it's a fantastic collaboration. I've been at several talks where uh, in areas that are very new to me, you know, so I think, you know, there, there's uh, there's space for uh, for that for that connection through various different mediums, you know, with the uh, the focus perhaps on, on, on the eco-social art or environmental art. So, yeah, thanks for holding the space for it also, Carmel. It's good. And yeah. Michelle, our IT person, Michelle. Okay. Yeah, I see. Her. Um, and then Great. Some, yeah, lovely comments there. So thank you. Thank you to everybody for attending and for, for giving the hour to listen to the talk. It's, all, it's always, I feel, I hope it's always worthwhile to do that. So thank you to everyone for attending. And thanks again, Kathy. Great. Thank you.
great. You're so welcome. Thanks, everyone. Sloan. Well.